Hi, I'm Zara Kramer. I'm the publisher at Panda Moon Publishing, and I'm delighted to be here with everybody tonight. It's interesting that um, we've got Nola, an author here. We've got Mike, who narrates our audiobooks. We've got uh -huh. Annie, who is our cherished reviewer. We've got Elgin, that is also a writer, but is also staff at Panda Moon. And you, so it's like interesting to hear from all these different perspectives on what books mean to you and how they resonate with you and kind of how you feel, uh, how they make you feel when you're reading them and then how you feel afterwards. Are you satisfied? Does it stay with you for a while? Was it, uh, was it something you just kind of needed to go be alone with? Like how I felt after the last episode of Breaking Bad, for instance, you know, <laughs> these yeah. series that just really capture you, you know, in multiple ways. And, you know, I was thinking about my reaction. I have a reaction as a reader, obviously. I'm first and foremost a reader, just like everybody else. But I'm also a publisher and, you know, probably, one of the most important things that I do here at Panda Moon is uh, make the final decision on which books we acquire that we will, you know, bring to the market. And I'm often asked, you know, what the process is that we go through as a company to choose. And that certainly is a conversation for, you know, a longer conversation, but we're opening for submissions next week on the 20th for the first time in two years. When I first started Panda Moon, you know, I wanted to be that company that was always open, that didn't have these closed submission windows. I wanted to be more inclusive. Uh, but the, you know, the faster we grew, we really needed to uh, change that policy because I needed to be able to continue providing quality products and we needed to be able to continue providing, you know, great support to our authors. So we've closed for two long years and we're opening up again and I'm very excited to see what's going to be out there. The books, you know, go through a multiple review processes. You know, there's just big, you know, a lot of steps because we can get thousands and thousands of submissions during these open windows. And as much as I wish I could read every book or, or even, you know, our acquisitions team read every book from start to finish, we just, there's just not enough uh, time in, in the world for that. So we have to make some critical decisions at various stages in the book. And then once the book has been deemed, you know, something that we're really interested in, we sit on it. Just like Annie, you were talking about how you need time to process what you've gone through. You need time for it to settle in your soul and for you to be able to decide, is that a forgettable book? or is it an unforgettable book? And those are the only books that I want us to publish at the end of moon are those that really stick with you. And while I may not remember every detail of every book um, that we, that we have published, cause you know, we started our, you know, back in 2012. So that's, that's a lot of books. I remember how every book made me feel every book. And the, there's this process that we go through at Panda Moon after the book has gone through the entire, uh, you know, multiple stages of editing. There's this one last little step, and it's called the final final. <laughs> I know it's a kind of a silly name. In essence, what it is, is it's my review of the completely, totally, fully edited book. And there are times when I have finished that review and I have cried because what I thought was a fantastic book um, when we acquired it, I am just blown away by the beauty of it once it's gone through the entire process. And I just, it is, 
such a joy and a gift when I get to do those final finals. And there has not been a book yet that has been published without me going through that one last review. That's when I feel it's just, it's just the most magical feeling in the world, knowing that, you know, you're releasing this baby out into the wild that, you know, so many people have worked on so many years and, you know, tears and fears and you name it, all the work that goes into it. That to me is the ultimate best part of my job. On the absolute opposite end of that is the acquisitions. And that's this phase that we're about to go through right now. So, um, because, because you don't, you don't want to say no to somebody, you know, because that's, oh my that's God. calling their, that's calling their baby ugly. That <laughs> is the absolute worst part of my job is to have to send out those rejection letters. And I know that the people that get them, I just, I just know how terrible it's going to make them feel. And for every person in the world that I have ever sent that letter to, I want you to understand the anguish that I felt in sending it is, it may not be the same level of your anguish, but believe me, every time that I, letter uh, you'll get sent, it, it, I feel it. There's an old, um, there's an old adage, I don't know how old it is, but I've, I've heard it many times as many sales courses as I've gone through in my various iterations but don't take a no as a no and and you don't take no as a no in sales because it really means not yet and mm -hmm. as an author if you want to succeed if you want to ever be a published author you have to not only develop a thick skin about being rejected because you're going to get rejected a lot you have to also understand that no means not yet. That there's something that needs to be done to the manuscript. And maybe that's trashing it and starting it over. But it's not ready to be published yet, or it's not ready to be acquired by a publisher yet. And that's what the rejection means. So, you know, anybody who wants to know the secret to becoming published, that's the secret as, as best I can express it, is you never give up on a project that you believe in. And you have to also realize that if you're reading a book and reviewing it yourself and revising it and working on it and working on it, working on it, and you're getting sick of the story, it's probably not a good book. Mm -hmm. mm. Hey, Mike, okay. you narrated a little book for us at Pandemoon called Project 137. I sure did. I love the characters in that book. Oh my gosh. Did you like that book? I love that book. I, I loved it. I loved the characters, especially. They were so colorful and vibrant. And Seth made it so easy to create these fun characters because he's incredibly descriptive about them. So let me tell you just a little backstory about that book. And I know that Seth um, has shared from his perspective the same story, so I don't think he'll mind. But um, this, go this is, goes into play with what Elgin was saying when he was talking about um don't take no for an answer so um i enjoyed project 137 when seth first submitted it you'll notice that i said enjoyed i didn't love it okay i did not love it and i was like oh it's close but what it's really missing is emotion and character development and so I did a lot of research into Seth because I, I put it aside for probably six weeks or more. Could not get this book out of my mind. So I did some research on Seth Augustine, the author. He's a reporter. He's a journalist. He was an, um, the editor-in-chief for Forensic Magazine before, unfortunately, it, it ceased to exist. But he is a technical writer that deals with uh, very scientific, dry subjects. And so I did something for Seth that I have only done one other time, and that is offer a revise and resubmit. So I sent him a special rejection letter, if you will. It, it, it said, 
I think you've got something there. No, 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 actually, you know, I take it back. It didn't happen that way. He got sent the normal rejection letter, but I hated sending it. I hated sending that letter. <laughs> he sent me an email and he said, you know, I appreciate that you let me know that you rejected it and you did so very nicely, but I think I'm just going to put the book, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm done with the book. Okay. I'm just not oh gosh. ever do anything with it again. So again, a couple of days went by. I, I never really respond to the people that respond to my rejection letter because invariably they're going to ask the question, why did you reject it? And right. then the one or two times that I've ever really answered them, you know, it's gotten into, it's not turned out well. So I just don't do that anymore. But Seth, I, I, the way he wrote it, I wrote back to him and this is what I said. If you want to keep writing on the book, I think you should. And here is why we said no to your book. And that's because you wrote it as if you were writing an article for your magazine. You weren't writing it as a fiction writer. You were writing it as a nonfiction writer. The story is there. The plot's there. The characters are there. I just need more. He's like, okay, thank you. You know, appreciate it. And I was like, I'll never hear from him again. A year <laughs> later, he emails me and he said, okay, okay. I thought about it. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go work on it. And it, it, will you really read it again? I said, yeah, I will. So he did. And it blew me away. That's awesome. He, wow. He knew how to write with that emotion. He knew how to develop the characters. He knew how to do all of that. He just was sort of constrained by the way he had been professionally writing for so long that yeah. he kind of forgot to, how to exercise those creative muscles. Yeah, and he once had to, he, he had did, to get back into himself and turn it back on. Oh my God. Yeah. So in that case, that's a, a, a good example of don't take no for an answer. What if he had just, what if he had not sent me that email back and said, you know, told me what he was going to do? What if I hadn't, you know, I just think about all these what ifs that at any point in time, either one of us could have given up on the other one, but we didn't. We ended up with a terrific author, magnificent book. Um, he's writing other books and I'm just, uh, it's, it's interesting how magic, book magic can happen sometimes. So I agree with Elgin, uh, don't give up. You know, take the time to go to writing workshops, um, join critique groups, get beta readers, and read. That's probably the most important thing you can do is to keep reading people's books. Those critique groups are very valuable. When I first started wanting to narrate fiction, I joined a local uh, critique group here, and I actually would read the author's work for them at the tables for practice for me, but then also it gave them a chance to hear it. And I grew a lot from it, but I, I learned a lot about the writing process through that because I'm not a writer at all. And uh, it was fascinating. I'm so glad that Seth didn't give up. That book is such a gem. Isn't it? And it's just so, you know, it just might never have been. But it was one of those books that one of those stories that I, I, I could, I could just feel there was a diamond in there. And, you know, so when you're, when, like when I was doing the final final of that book and it was just, ah, that was, one of those, uh, that was like the one red books in another world series. Let me tell you, that's how good it felt. <laughs> that's another one of those cross genre books, uh, Annie, that we were talking about earlier. It's, I love those. It's a it's a dystopian kind of science fiction in a way, but not really solid science fiction. It's um, like um, and it, and it, and it's historically accurate to to a, a very strong degree because it's based on stuff that happened during World War II. I mean, real stuff. Really, it's really, really great, stuff. interesting uh, book. You can tell by, you know, like you have Nola here um, in her book, you know, has so much historical truth and relevancy into it. You can see as a publisher the types of writers well, that I am drawn to. Well, Panda Moon has a, you know, a Panda Moon book. 
you know? I mean, you do. You know a Panda Moon book. Well, it, start, it starts off with the cover, which, which uh, Zara is very uh, strongly uh, tied to the quality of the covers. And she has the final approval on those, too. And, uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I've given away any secret that she's kind of a control freak, but that's, I mean, that's a good thing for a publisher to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I try so hard, but you know, <laughs> these aren't just the author's babies. They're my little babies too. <laughs> and I just I just want them dressed perfectly, you know, and and prepared and but um I'm just grateful that you know, we have a corporate ethos where everybody's input into the project is valid and listened to and is incredibly important. It doesn't matter what part of the publishing process you're in. Every, everybody's input is really important in providing the, the level of experience that we want our readers and listeners uh, to, to get from a pandemic book. We want them to know that, you know, while we may not have, uh, every genre that they love, or they may not love all of our genres, the, they might be encouraged to try something maybe out of their zone just a little bit because um, they they know the quality of the book that we put out. And so hopefully, you know, they will understand that the underlying theme between every one of our books is the complex layers of plot, character development, world building, and a level of authenticity of voice from each one of our authors. They might write in the same general genre like science fiction or mystery or something, but they well, all um, speak, you know, such a different language or sing a different tune, but they all sound so beautiful together, and there we and go. Our, uh, our our editors are really good at drawing stuff out of the authors in the in the creative process, and they actually they actually become <coughs> part of the final writing of the book without actually writing it themselves because they're drawing they're drawing more of the best out of the author. They can <coughs> sometimes see things that you as an author overlook and and they'll point it out to you. You know that you know that here, you know, I thought that this was going to happen in the book. And then you go, wow, I hadn't even thought of that. And then it, it becomes more of a collaboration between the editor and the author. And now the editor is a lot more invested in the, in the project because they contributed to it. Yeah. Let me give you an example of what Elgin's saying. I'm going to tell on Elgin right now. Yeah. Yeah. So we had um, uh, Becoming Superman, which is book one in his uh, Superman series. And when he first, you know, pitched the book to me, it was one book. And I'm like, you know, uh, it's a little out of the norm of what we publish, but which is normal for me. <laughs> but it has baseball in it, and it is a delightful story. So I said, let's do it. So he and his editor, who is Jessica Rhino for, the, this, for this series of his books, uh, they were working on it, and I pinged Elgin, and I'm like, you know, how's the editing working out? Um, you got the book done, and he's like, oh, yeah, but after meeting with um, Jessica, we've decided it's now going to be a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? And he <laughs> said, yeah, we just brainstormed together and came up with, you know, yep. a couple more storylines. <clears throat> it took about an hour, hour and a half. We were in, we were on a chat together, and we started throwing, throwing ideas back and forth because I... First of all, I wasn't completely satisfied with the ending of the book. And I, I, I'm the first to tell you that I suck at writing endings. It's the reason why I write series. <laughs> and, and, Excellent and the, point. And the, uh, the ending needed something else in it. 
So that's what that's what that's what started the discussion. And uh, I'm sorry, I have to go. Okay, I'm Annie. Sorry. Thanks for right. thanks for being here. Thank Bye, you for Annie. having me. It was nice seeing everybody. Bye, Zara. Bye, -bye. Bye Alan. Bye, Nola. Thank Annie. you. Good night. Bye. Bye so Je Jessica said, you know, you know, there's more there's more stories in this that you can tell because there's this thread here, there's this thread here that you didn't do anything with. And I said, yeah, you're right. I said, I was kind of like leaving that up to the reader to interpret. She said, well, it's okay as it is, but you could do this and you could do this. So over the course of about an hour, an hour and a half, we actually rough, roughly plotted out, um, you know, two more stories, you know, two more books. Wow. And um, it, it's kind of funny because I don't normally write that way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm what, uh, what they call a pantser, you know, right, by the seat of my pants. But then I go <laughs> back, I go back and I look at what I've written and I create an outline and I move stuff around in the story. And it actually fits into an outline structure at that point. Um, I'm not one of the people like, you know, we have uh, Laura Ellen Scott has like a storyboard that looks like, you know, the the thing that you see in um, in uh, uh, you know crime dramas, you know, like in Homeland, the board with all the the pins everywhere, and the pins, <laughs> and, you know, the pins and the strings and everything going to it. That's the way she does her books. I can't write that way. I mean, I yeah, I could write that way, but it'd be it would be uninteresting. And the way but I write, if something I, doesn't work. He just adds some kind of magical being in to make it happen. Exactly, or you know, a plot twist. You know, something starts getting boring. You throw in a plot yeah, plot twist. Everybody dies. Everybody dies, <laughs> and, then they, and then they come back to life. All of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> right. an arrow. And then you know, you keep writing because you can fix all that stuff when you realize it. Don't don't worry about where, you know, you made your mistakes when you're writing it, and that's when you that's when you apply the outline to it. So. Essentially, what, what uh, Jessica and I were doing we were applying an outline to the um, to the first, but not only the first book, but also the two books that were going to happen later that I hadn't even written yet. And but the thing is, I had some of these ideas that were kicking around, and in the course of coming up with um, with what was going to happen next and what was going to happen next, I figured out how to end the first book. Hey. There you go. I hate to do this, guys, but I have got to run. Okay. We are launching the new website next week, and my goal is so. Um, it looks you're gonna, great, too, by the way. Uh, oh. Tomorrow, all of the authors, uh, all the staff, everybody at Pin to Moon will get a link to the new website. It is not, well, it is it is live, but it is not live like at pandamoonpublishing.com. So, um it's on a, it's on our server it's yeah we're, uh, can't wait to see it how fun yeah it's 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 the bookstore portion is fantastic it's it is in much uh more streamlined than what we've got now there's a lot less kind of extraneous data it is really focused in on the books and the sales process of it um, it's, I think everyone's really going to like it. Um, we've got a whole lot more of different features that we're going to be adding to it. And I'll, I'll do a big presentation on it in a few weeks, but right now I'm just trying to get everything launched phase one anyway, launched before we open up for submissions on the 20th. Uh, I want to make sure that all of that's working. So tomorrow, everybody else is going to, Everybody within Pain the Moon is going to get a link. I want everybody to go to it and take a look at it. But Rachel and I have been working round the clock basically for the last, I don't know what, three, four weeks now at this home stretch trying to get everything done, at least for you guys to take a look at and for us to go live uh, early next week. It's a, so anyway, it's a lot more responsive um, than our present website, too. So that, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the things that we learned uh, from the present website have been 
uh, fixed in the new one, and uh, and it is more focused on sales, <laughs> and, uh, and more author uh, more author centric. You know, to to introduce people to the authors and their and their various books, and allow the interaction between uh, the author and the greater community of readers. So I think that's that's the focus. Of, and we talked about this back in December. And it was one of those wild ideas that we came up in our planning session for that for this year. And um, I'm I'm really impressed with uh, with what you and Rachel have done for it. Well, it has been. Uh, there's just so many back end operations that are required from the financial standpoint of say as a product manufacturer and you know, collecting taxes from 50 different states and all these different countries and, you know, all, all of these things that our distributors have been taking care of it for us. And they will continue to do so for the products that are sold through them. But now that we have the ability to sell our products ourselves, we're going to be putting a lot of our resources into that and just getting all of our processes to talk to each other. So, um, but it's great. And and one, just, and one of the great things is we'll be able to do pre-orders on print books. Yes. That was one of the um, reasons, I guess, that really propelled us is that Amazon just is not going to offer that as an option anytime soon. And we really wanted to be able to offer that service to our authors and for our authors' fans that are really interested in supporting them at launch, but really want the physical copy, you know, in their hand. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's all exciting news and can't wait for to start hearing feedback from you guys tomorrow. Don't know what time it is, what time it'll be. There's a couple things Rachel and I identified late tonight or before that I came onto this, uh, that we want to make sure we get, uh, fixed before we share with you, uh, tomorrow, but we're close. So y'all have a good evening. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was really nice. Um, it's nice to hear Mike bring these characters alive. Now I've listened to the audio books, but there's something about actually watching him as he's voicing uh -huh. the characters that, you know, it almost feels like you're watching a play, you know, in, in action. Wow. Really Thank nice. You. Thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's such yeah, a joy to do. The faces. I like, I like watching you do the faces. Yeah. <laughs> As he changes characters, his expressions change to, you know. It does. Really That's cool. so crazy to hear. I had no idea I did that. Yeah. You do. Yeah. <laughs> so you should record your, your video of yourself. That's terrifying. It's bad enough to have to listen to myself, you guys. No. I can't imagine having to watch myself too. Good gracious. <laughs> That's funny. It's great though, Mike. It's fun to watch. Uh, I get so into it. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye. 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 Bye.